Awesome Inc. presents the Kentucky Entrepreneur Hall of Fame, a show that highlights how people throughout the Commonwealth of Kentucky pursue their definition of awesome through entrepreneurship, technology, and innovation. Thank you for listening to this special episode of the Kentucky Entrepreneur Hall of Fame podcast. My name is Garrett Farbach, and I focus on the relational and creative projects here at Awesome Inc. in Lexington, Kentucky. During this past summer, Awesome Inc. hosted the first ever Lexington Entrepreneurship Day as an effort to bring together the entrepreneurial community of Lexington, Kentucky. We hosted it June 27th, 2018, and on that day, we had an amazing time celebrating entrepreneurship, but more importantly, we were celebrating the memory of Dr. Pierce Lyons, the founder of Alltech. You're about to hear a live interview hosted at Awesome Inc. between Aidan Connolly, the former Chief Innovation Officer of Alltech, and Keith McMunn, the Fellowship Director at Awesome Inc. So sit back, relax, and get ready to hear some inspirational wisdom that Aidan Connolly had to share during his time at LED. You're the, uh, the Chief Innovation Officer at Alltech, the Vice President of Corporate Accounts. Uh, you're an adjunct, adjunct professor in three different countries and a board member for several international agriculture organizations. Naturally, all of our first question is, do you ever plan on doing anything with your life? <laughs> My mother is still wondering that. She said, uh, I don't understand this agricultural thing. There's very noble careers out there, like banking and real estate and car sales. And I mean, why did you get involved in agriculture, for God's sake? There's nothing in agriculture that's exciting or sexy. And guess what? It is. In fact, it turns out that feeding uh, seven and a half billion people, maybe to soon to be 10 billion people, is an exciting thing to do. And the agricultural space has massive issues in terms of um, primarily productivity and waste resources. And we keep hearing about, oh, the carbon footprint of animals and so on. And, you know, should I be eating meat? Should I not be eating meat? So I can't imagine a more exciting area to be in than agriculture at the moment, believe it or not. So tell us, tell us kind of geographically, educationally, where, where have you been and what's, what's brought you to where you are here today? Well, everywhere. Um, started in Ireland, uh, did an MBA there, joined Alltech, a year in Ireland as, in marketing. Then they moved me into sales in France. Uh, I think Pierce thought I spoke French. Um, I don't know how he thought I spoke French. He saw me <laughs> speak to somebody in French at a dinner one night and he said, oh, you speak French. He said, Pierce, that's not French. That's like... <laughs> That's like taxi French or that's whatever. So um, I was moved to France, obviously had to learn French pretty quickly. Uh, I was on my own, uh, setting up the business, so really entrepreneurial in many ways, well, in all ways. Um, ran the sales and marketing there for two and a half years. Then I just thought Brazil sounded exciting. So moved to Brazil for four and a half, where we set up a production facility. We got involved in research. We got... So when I left there, that was uh, already up to about $7 million and was our second largest business globally. And then I moved to Kentucky, uh, lived in, uh, up here in Chevy Chase for about four years doing different businesses for all tech, really businesses that were having a few issues. And then the biggest issue was Europe. It hadn't grown in about five years. So he sent me back to Europe to run 50 countries for all tech. I did that for six years and we increased the sales from 25 million to 105 million in those six years. So average growth of 28% a year. So it was very nice. And from then uh, Washington DC, six years, and then into the other things like some of the educational parts I do both internally and externally. But what does is, what is Alltech do um, for those of us who don't understand or know? Um, basically we make supplements for animals. So everybody around the room understands that you, if you take supplements, vitamin supplements, mineral supplements, you might live longer, you might be healthier, your fertility might be better, less risk of disease. We do that for animals. Now, in the case of humans, our challenge is our metabolisms are pretty slow. So, you know, you're smoking today or you're not, I don't know, let's say assume you're smoking a cigarette. The damage you do to yourself might take 50 years to see. But animals are growing so quickly, you see the damage within weeks. So we don't have psychosymmetric benefits in animals. If they take a pill and it works, it's because the pill worked. And we give them sugars from yeast, we give them probiotics. We, all these are natural ingredients, but we use science to identify which ones would work. And they solve disease, they help them be more efficient, so lower 
better feed efficiency, they call it, better weight gain, more milk, more meat, more eggs, happier animals. So part of our goal here today, obviously, and we've kind of touched on it with the video, is we, we would love to honor uh, Dr. Pierce Lyons. And so would you tell us a little bit about Pierce Lyons and, and maybe even a lesson uh, that you've learned from him or his leadership? Um, well, I, I've described it already. So obviously he was a scientist who was also fantastic at sales. That's very unusual. Somebody who creates and can sell. I know we heard from Kurt earlier and you have the same skills, Kurt, but it is extremely unusual in this world. Most scientists are abysmal at selling and most business people don't ever want to understand the science. So having that bridging that gap was tremendous. Probably the most important was his impatience with wanting to grow quickly, his impatience with uh, people in the sense of saying, why are my dreams for you bigger than your dreams for you? Why am I imagining, you know, sending you to France and you're telling me how you don't speak French? Shouldn't you just take the opportunity and go? Um, and when I called him up and said um, that I was interested in the Brazilian opportunity, I knew I wasn't going to have a second chance. So there was no point calling him up and asking, did I want, you know, did I, did I want to go or tell me why I should go or tell me why this is a good opportunity. He was like, if you are asking me about this opportunity, you need to tell me you want this opportunity and I'll give you this opportunity, but don't, you know, don't, don't, don't limit yourself by waiting for me to sell it to you because I'm not going to do it. A lot of, a lot of the folks in this room uh, dream of becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, may lead businesses uh, already, um, or they just really, or they're teaching a class uh, in Hazard, Kentucky about entrepreneurship. Uh, I want to know from your perspective, how important is it for a founder's legacy to be lived on or the values or uh, the attributes of a founder to be uh, in the business and through the business, uh, even after maybe the founder passes passes on or, or leaves the company? Yeah, well, obviously, uh, the, the, the death of Pierce lines and you know it, I put it like that just to make it clear just what's happened it's not just he kind of passed on to another room he died and it was completely unexpected and you create a business as he did that's a two and a half billion dollar business and you've six thousand people um there's an awesome to use the word of the day awesome responsibility in everybody else to to carry on that legacy there's, it's not just five thousand people there's twenty five thousand people there's the families there's the you know there's all of our suppliers there's the people who so I think thinking through what that looks like, be it that you want to pass the business on to venture capital company that comes in to buy it, be it that you want to pass it on because you think I'm an entrepreneur and I don't like this whole piece of bureaucracy of what happens next. Um, having that plan of what your succession is going to be is absolutely essential. In our case, the culture of Alltech is so laden with many, many pieces. People turn up in ties, don't ask why. It's just been kind of that's, you know, we dress that way. Uh, we wear an all tech pin to show that we work for the company. The company, when you walk into it, you see from the furniture, you see from the, the gardens, you see from the way the things laid out, there's a way to lay out a room for an all tech meeting. So that piece that he gave us is codified. And I met with uh, Governor Bevan and he said, Aiden, um, it's very important for you to think in the next month uh, following the passing of Pierce Lines about what it is that he was and write all those things down. You know, Pierce, one of his things is find out what someone's problem is. Yeah. And and if you were to say, Keith, you've got 20 minutes, figure out what some problems are in agriculture, <laughs> I would just, I'd be a headless chicken. I mean, I wouldn't know where to, where to look. And so, and, and as you say them, some of them are so just obvious to me. But most, and this I think happens in all startups, um, in the agriculture startup field, startups are riding on farms and they're promoting 50 reasons why you need to use my, 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 my new idea. And farmers listen to that and go, I don't believe any of it. If you really had a good story, you tell me one. If you possibly had a good story, you tell me one plus two others. But once you got past three, I'm not believing you because now I think you're just BSing. And that's a fundamental disconnect in the startup world. Um, and I've said to them, drill down to what the number one advantage is going to be, like you just said. For me, the one number one bench in most farm situations it is the cow eating, is the chicken eating, is the pig eating, is the dog eating, is the horse eating, or not. If you can tell me that and how much they're eating, everything else is predicated, everything else is a consequence of that. But just start off with that basic number, or that basic measurement, and then a, a lot of things start to happen. And that's, you know, but it's back to this piece of simplify what you're saying, 
don't try to promote too, too many advantages, particularly in the farming. But I've seen it in other, I mean, I've been listening to startups involved in many, many different businesses. It shocks me how it's like they've got this diarrhea, verbal diarrhea. Let me tell you the 50,000 things my new idea could do for you. Screw it. Give me one reason. Tell me the cost benefit. Tell me why I should use it. And if you can convince me on that one reason, then tell me the other 50,000 later. So I want to I want to make this a little bit uh, you know applicable for folks in the room uh, who either own businesses or work for businesses, uh, whether they're in charge or they're not in charge. Uh, I want to ask you the question: How uh, how would you encourage somebody who works under a manager to promote innovation, and how would you encourage a manager who is uh, I don't know working with a dozen or more uh, employees on? on sparking more innovative thinking? How would you give them permission? What are some tips for maybe those two groups of people? I suppose I, I'm, I'm thinking of the first question from a, a larger bureaucratic uh, mindset, which is what happens when you've got 300 employees, 1,000 employees, 3,000 employees. And frankly, I think you're dead. I, I, I'm really struggling to see where big companies go in the future because all the big companies I know are struggling mightily with innovation. And are com they, they are... In the old days, when I needed a good idea, I, I always tell a story, but I, I literally would go down and I'd meet Kurt or meet Dr. Dawson or meet whoever. They were wearing a white coat. I knew that therefore they were smarter than me. I'd tell them what my problem was. They'd come back with an answer. And so the PhD gave you the answer to your problem and then you went from there. Then we went into the field of realizing big companies weren't good at, at innovating. So we would buy other people's ideas. It seems as though now we have to engage with startups and most large organizations are really struggling with that. So you hear the phrase, as we know already, you guys are very familiar with startup weekends, hackathons, uh, incubators, accelerators, late stage accelerators, and a series of other names that are being used around the space, which basically is this thing of feeling like big companies just flailing around trying to figure out what the heck are we going to do? And most of them are investing in, in most of the investment in startups is, is not going that well for me. I, I'm looking because they do this bear hug thing where they bring the small startup into their into their environment and then they kill it um, by either having them at the water cooler with the office politics or drinking coffee with people telling them why it's not going to work or where they're off find themselves in competition with the, in, with the research and development or sometimes what I call the research and non-development department of large organizations because it, it failed so often. Um, and they don't want you to succeed. So this is going to be a really interesting world, I think, as we move forward. I'm a big believer in the startup environment. I believe that that environment succeeds because it's entrepreneurial and because you've got fire in the belly and hopefully you wake up a little hungry in the morning and you need to sell. Innovation is a very future-oriented topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Can you talk about ways that, I don't know, can it get in the way of the now? Can it, can it distract you from uh, performing day to day? Uh, and if so, have you experienced that? Yeah, um, I suppose when you're starting up, a little bit like a kid in the candy shop, you're wondering, well, what am I going to focus on? What am I going to do? So last year we ran an incubator with late stage agricultural technology companies. There was about, um, 10 of them, they've raised 30 million between the 10. So they were well-funded and they uh, were starting to be quite successful. We helped them raise about 60 million in new leads uh, across the 10 companies, about $6 million per company. So it's not quite the same as some of the people maybe in this room, but the number one thing they struggled with, as I mentioned already, was selling. And I focused them on saying, who do you want to meet? Oh, I want to meet, I'd love to meet uh, strawberry people in California. Driscoll's, okay. So I'd open up LinkedIn and say, who do you want to meet in Driscoll's? I know them. Who do you want to meet in uh, CP, the biggest shrimp producer in Thailand? Who do you want to meet? So I was basically opening my LinkedIn page, about 14,000 contacts and saying, I'll get you a coffee with whoever you want to meet. I know these people. And that, of course, for startup is invaluable. The second thing that we did with them was we ran what we call a 2143. So the two, which is the now, which we start with in our 2143, is just about where are you actually really honestly now? Company history, which large companies love to talk about, and this is uh, this kills them. We say for large companies in particular, kill a company history story. We know that Alltech's awesome. We know Dr. Lanz is awesome. What do you, what you do for me today? Forget all the rest of it. Drill it down to as short as possible, and then pick three big breakthroughs. And those, for me, in the case of startups, are 
big customers that you want to get, big businesses you want to get. So this is, for me, a, a huge tool for any company. And I have worked with startups on it, and it has helped them survive and thrive and turns around. And they would describe the $60 million business leads to, to the 2143. Yeah. Um, yeah, in my experience with working some, with some startups, I would encourage any, uh, any business owner, any startup founder um, to just prepare a pitch, whether it's, uh, what I would encourage you to do is think through the different types of people that you will speak with and what message they need to hear, whether they're an investor or a partner or a customer, and also be prepared like, okay, I've got one minute, I've got two minutes. This is what I would say if I had three minutes. And just do one more thing, because I think that's extremely important, Pete, but I would add in, every single time you say something, think of the WIFM, what's in it for me? There's so much talk out there that is just loose, unthought through. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna give my standard piece of, and a lot of startups give standard pieces to our customers of, this is how I pitch for money. They're saying, you're not pitching for money. They wanna buy your product. So think about why they wanna buy your product. So every single time before you open your mouth, if you say to yourself, every time before you show a slide, every time before you say something, think about your audience, think about what's in it for me. And I think you're going to, well, you cut your talk in about half at least, maybe a third. So as, a, as the chief innovation officer, you have been tasked, uh, I don't know how ongoing this, this project is, but, um, but you've been tasked with building a team in the research department at Alltech. Would you speak to, uh, for anybody who is building a team or is joining a team, um, what are the important aspects of building the right team? Um, well, in the research team, it's pretty simple. It's how much access do they have of how customers think? And as we've gotten bigger, our researchers are more and more disconnected from the marketplace. And they were complaining, I see some of my marketing colleagues here, they're complaining saying, why do marketing not, you know, why didn't they not talk to us? I said, well, how long has it been since you marched down to marketing and went to see them? Oh, well, I'd never do that. No, they need to come and see me. So I, I've been really desperately trying to think of ways to get my researchers out in the field, meeting customers, not just going to science meetings. Um, I've been thinking about different ways of causing, creating different communication methods. One I said was, everybody in the research team needs to learn how to communicate by using a one picture. So tell me what your research project looks in a picture. No data, no words, just a picture. And that has been quite interesting to see how that helps them realize some people don't learn through words and numbers and a lot of us are visual and we need to see, you know, before afterwards, a dog with nice hair and a dog with no hair. In terms of generally building teams, respecting differences in, in, in types of people, um, I use a lot of uh, this personality typing for major types in the DISC model, which are drivers, influencers, um, oh, uh, cooperatives and uh, socials. And then uh, we've had some fun um, by taking photographs of the different four major personality types offices and asking people to recognize the type of personality by how they lay out their office. So we talked about understanding maybe yourself or your coworkers. Would you mind sharing, like, what are some quick ways that we can understand our customers? Um, well, obviously, ask them is the usual answer, and surprisingly, people don't do that. Your questions need to be open questions. Too many times, I think, we're walking through the door. Do you have a problem with manpower scheduling? Would you like a new piece of software for that? I have this piece of software. What are you using at the moment? Um, if you could slow yourself down just to ask questions to establish what the real needs and wants are, you're going to lead to much more powerful answers. So off open questions, use lots of the time in the first meeting to get them talking, not you. Um, those would be the two, the what's in it for me, thinking through before you say something. Uh, but take your time. I know we're all in a hurry and we want to make the sale quickly. Take your time to understand your customers some uh, maybe my next couple of questions applicable to people in this room. Uh, so if anybody has kind of a, a situation that they'd like to, to include, uh, I'll start with this. What would you tell your 20 year old self? I, I suppose I was lucky because I had peers effectively mentoring me. Maybe he was mentoring a thousand other people, but I felt like he was mentoring me and pushing me into things. The primary piece was going overseas. That was a big, big thing for me. Um, I've learned French, I've learned Spanish, I've learned Portuguese. My French and Portuguese are pretty good, actually. Um, I can give talks in front of 100 people in that language on whatever subject. It, it's always the panic of where is it, is it going to come, and then under pressure it comes. Um, and then obviously being able to experience the world and travel. If that's not an opportunity for you to live in another country, I would say get yourself a passport and travel no matter what. 
j- just get out there and get to see as many places as possible. Uh, what would you tell yourself if you were, um, let's say, 30 years old and quitting your company? It just feels that we're heading into a dramatically different world. I am um, a big uh, follower of, um, I'm not going to remember his first name, I think it's Yale, no, Noel anyway is his name. He's a writer and he wrote a book called Homo Sapiens and he wrote subsequently a book called Homo Deus. And these are scary books, but they're extremely fascinating and wonderful to read. And he was being asked um, you know, to describe the work f- world of the future based on all his thinking about where humankind has come from and where we're going. And he would be a believer in the singularity concept or um, that we're merging with machines. So increasingly, we're going to see a merging of humans and machines in the future. So he said, well, what would you recommend kids in their 20s or 30s? Or, you know, what would you say to them about where they should go to college or what should they learn or what should they do? And he said, what I teach people or tell people is assume that if you do go to college and even you do a master's PhD, your learning never finishes. That if you make the mistake of thinking that you, because you've got a PhD, you're done, then you will be passed by everybody else, and then you will be passed by the machines. The only way for you to stay ahead of this game in the next 30 to 50 years is to become a continuous learner. Um, I don't fear the work world maybe the way I would have 20 years ago, that you have to be associated with a large organization, you need a pension. Of course you need a pension, of course you need the safety net. Um, but I think the willingness on the behalf of companies to look at people who've taken risks with their careers and tried different things is much greater. And um, I would go out there and, you know, if you obviously you need to be extremely feet on the ground, make sure you're doing the right thing. But um, taking some chance with your career, if you're in a large organization, try to find the way to do things that nobody else is doing. Go to places nobody else is going. Uh, offer yourself for opportunities that nobody else is taking. Just take, take, take the risks, the appropriate risks that you can. You know, sometimes you're married, you're, you've got a mortgage, you've got a, all those pieces start to play in and those make it much more difficult. But if you have the opportunity, don't limit yourself by thinking about where am I going to be in three years' time. Just, just, just go for where you are now. Would you, you know, would you talk about maybe the difference between two types of people here? Uh, somebody that comes to try and apply to work for Alltech or work for you. Uh, that you're like, yes, I want that person on my team, and a person that no, I don't, I don't particularly want that person on my team. Is there, are there attributes that you look for that indicate this person is going to fit well here? Yeah, the the, the number one, um, I could go through a whole long list of kind of lists of things that are relevant to the particulars of the job. The number one thing I'm looking for is fire in the belly. And I don't know how to describe how to interview for that. And I don't know how to ask, to tell you which questions I ask, but I'm asking questions looking for that. But people who've got fire in the belly, they're just going to succeed. And people who are comfortable and people who, you know, just want to work from nine to five or whatever, they're just not for me. So I, I'm looking for people that want to be better and I'm looking for people that want to change the world and people who are a little bit angry on the inside. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Maybe not. Maybe he's not the healthiest person in the world. Maybe not the happiest person in the world. But by God, they're going to contribute to all tech and to to what I want to achieve. What is something big and exciting that you're working on right now? If you're willing or able to share. Um. Well, we're continuing to work on our accelerator and um, this late stage accelerator, and really so happy with the moment we're trying to expand it. We are looking to do something in Kentucky. And that we have not done so far. There were the right and wrong reasons why we didn't. We started off and thought it through and felt we actually didn't want the bear hug problem. So we set up our accelerator in Ireland. And obviously, from you can tell from my accent and Dr. Lyons, uh, we have an affinity for Ireland. But uh, Mark Lyons and myself have been talking about doing something substantive here in Lexington. And that will be the next big thing. But trying to fit it in within the efforts we have already. So look at a global environment. So the next month, I'm going to be on a road show of going to China, Brazil, um, India, Ireland, and now equally, we're starting tomorrow night uh, here in Lexington internally to try to drive more innovation and more ideas internally and match those with companies outside. So that, that's probably the big one. When I say to anybody, we're in 130 countries and we employ five and a half thousand people. When I say anybody is in a startup, anybody connected with all with the the with Kentucky. This is like 130 embassies of Kentucky in the world. You can walk into 130 offices in the world, introduce yourself as coming from Kentucky, and the Altic person say, how can I help you? 
And I don't know of anything that Kentucky has of that nature. And it is that serious because everybody who's been in our offices has been to the one, they've been to the symposium, been here in May, they know where Lexington is. You won't have a long conversation. And I'd say, you know, in the same way, if I can help you, I have no limitations on who I help and who I don't help. If I can help somebody, make a connection to somebody else, you know, some way down the road, hopefully, God willing, I, you know, I get some benefit from what, what I've done, but I'm not financially motivated by that. I think that the world is increasingly about connections. And that's, that's my one word would be to you. See all tickets, your connector. If I can be a connector, I'll be a connector. We'd love to help. Great. All right. Well, that's it. We want to say thank you again so much for checking out the Kentucky Entrepreneur Hall of Fame podcast. Special thanks to Lee Rosevere for the music that you hear in the show and to Lexington's Awesome Inc. for hosting us from their space. Again, I'm Garrett Farbach. Make sure to check back and tune in next time. We'll see you then.